So my name is David Livingston. I'm an independent researcher. I did start going to university for a few years, but I soon recognized that uh, it's what I called an institution of higher indoctrination. There's a lot of information available there, but it's not possible to follow the facts where they lead. The opposite is the purpose. The purpose is to ensure that you don't connect the dots. We basically want you to regurgitate the status quo uh, agenda. So I've been studying on my own ever since, about 35 years now. I've written in five books. My latest is a six-volume set, which is called Ordo Ab Cal. And uh, basically, all this time is I'm trying to understand, at least to what we're going to talk about, I'm trying to understand what's happening now. And the only way to understand what's happening now is to understand the agenda and the motivations. And for that, you got to understand what are the beliefs of those who shape that agenda. And really, it's based on uh, a belief system that goes back uh, a couple of thousand years. And uh, it's possible to trace it that far back, follow along in all those years of who was responsible for maintaining it, how they influenced each other, how it developed to actually understand, you know, at least better understand what's going on today. Well, look, I mean, you've put me in mind of uh, one of my favourite uh, Eton College students. Um, that's George Orwell. When he talked that, about he who controls the present controls the past. The past. He who controls the past controls the future. Um, exactly. And so what you seem to be saying is that there's quite a lot of effort, even at the universities, to hold down that that um, analysis. Absolutely. That's a, there's a, in fact, there's a fascinating book on the subject, particularly the American system. It's a Marxist perspective, but it's really good. It's called Universities in the Capitalist State by Clyde Barrow, and he details how the university system was appropriated by a number of foundations, but leading among them, of course, the Rockefeller Foundation, which, you know, is the foundation that basically shaped uh, the United States in the, in the 20th century. But basically, they took They took a a, a university system uh, across the United States, which was decentralized uh, without any kind of standards. And through their uh, funding of board of trustees, uh, they helped sort of recruit uh, these various universities agenda. They helped them to uh, shape their faculties, their their teaching methods, their teaching content, and uh, and then through uh, what's called the, the 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 board of education, what's the, the W? The, so the the board of the main board of education in the United States is basically how they've been uh, managing their control, and then you know through various other means they manage to effectively control, monitor the type of education that they communicate. In fact, you know what they did? This is really really important. So what they did is that, especially after World War I, they created what's called the Western Civilization Course. And there's an article on this by, this is a scholarly academic article by, I think it's Richard Allardyce, John Allardyce something. And it shows how the Rockefeller Foundation created this so-called Western Civilization Course, or what they call the Great Books Course. And it's a Hegelian version of history. So it's the it's the it's a version of history that teaches that uh, Western civilization uh, is has progressed since Greece. It's a it's a natural spontaneous evolution towards secularism. So that you know free thought began in Greece and evol- evolved through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and culminated into this wonderful product that we called liberal uh, democracy. And so that's effective. the The purpose of it at the time was to uh, serve uh, to uh, justify America's involvement in World War One, because that was the main uh, holdup at the time. Is that it was it was it had been a challenge to try to get America involved. So by promoting the idea that America was actually part of a larger uh, Western uh, civilization and uh, with a duty to come to the defense of democracy wherever it was threatened. And so effectively, as you can see, as you know. That's the that's the lie that has been taught, and this is what happened to me: is that I went to a college in Concordia in Montreal here, 
It's called their, their, the liberal arts. It was a small, it was a college within a university. And uh, it was called the Liberal Arts College. And the purpose of it, strangely enough, was to revive the Western Civilization course, to give like a more traditional, what they call liberal arts education. So when I got to, you know, when they began to try to indoctrinate me into this nonsense about so-called Western version of history, a lot of points of it really didn't make any sense. So I wanted to try to understand uh, where this idea was coming from and if it was wrong, how was it wrong and how do I find out the truth? And I'm still at it. <laughs> so that's what I started when I was, you know, about 35 years ago. And that's really what spurred me to, to, to study what I have and to produce what I have. Well, you've reminded me of a chap called Norman Dodd as well, because he's quite famously yes, exactly. talked Taxes about foundations. Yeah, he talked about the way that the Carnegie exactly Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, yeah. were, um, uh, this is mainly after the Second World War. Right. They they adopted a specific program. Remember, of course, these people don't pay any tax. They are Correct. there to apparently educate people like a charity. Right. Uh, <laughs> the only thing is that they've got a very, very um, a political agenda. agenda. Yep. which is uh, i mean he, what he was talking about norman was talking about was because uh, he actually w- worked worked in with these people yes he did um and it, he explained that they had decided that they were going to create for all the main faculties he started off by discussing the, the faculties of economics that they were going right. to fund uh, and actually educate if you yeah. can call it that a kind of uh, yes. not not hypnosis but to let these people realize that there was a rather wonderful gravy train here that they could get on if they wanted to <laughs> right uh, the um the, to 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 fund what what he described as a stable of economists who yes. would start to dominate the uh, whole of the, it's amazing to think really that they yeah. they were adopting a, a method there uh, yeah. For a start to dominate uh, university education on these enormous subjects in the United States, and then of course the rest exactly. of the Western world. The rest of the world, exactly. So no, that's the that's the other book that goes into the detail, explains exactly uh, what's going on, and that's why it's, the book is called Tax Exempt Foundations. And that what's important to note there is that's exactly what happened, right? What happened is that uh, John D. Rockefeller uh, was perceived for being the scoundrel that he was, and so. He, uh, you know, his his company was broken up through the anti Sherman anti trust uh, regulations, which broke up. Uh, well, Standard Oil was one of the pieces, I guess. That's right. But, this uh, was around the time of the First World War. Yes, and so what he figured, what he did, is that he bought back his reputation by funding all these quote unquote charities. But what he was, of course, doing was using his money for political methods, but getting away with not even paying any taxes so he could use even more of his funds for his devious deeds. So what's important now is that uh, his grandson, David Rockefeller, who was the head of the, the, the Rockefeller Foundation. So two things I wanted to point out is that in the 20th century, the um, uh, first of all, the Rockefeller family, a large part of their funds come from Saudi Arabia, right? Which is, I think, a third of the world's world's oil resources. First established there in 1933 with the help of the Saudis and British uh, shenanigans. And so, um, uh, and ever since that time, there are two fronts that were used by the CIA uh, to cover for their activities, and that's the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. And now, and secondly, um, Bill Gates has admitted to being to uh, he his, he was friends with David Rockefeller and looked at him as a mentor and modeled his career on him, and so this is why you see that Bill Gates did. Which the irony is that Bill Gates was uh, a, he was charged under the same Sherman antitrust rules that his that uh, David's uh, grandfather was, and that. Um, you know, with his reputation destroyed, Bill Gates did the same thing, started these immense charities to make it seem like he's some kind of wonderful philanthropist, when, of course, he's pushing through the same agenda as all his uh, cronies have been doing all along. Yeah, and um, there's also the link with the, with the Rockefeller family to Zionism. Uh, one of the people I interviewed years ago was... Um, 
uh, his name was John Loftus, who was who was a uh, special prosecutor yes. appointed by Jimmy Carter. He wrote a right. book called The War Against the Jews. Yeah. Uh, and he explained uh, that the vote in 1948 at the United Nations was a very, uh, well, it was extremely dicey as to whether Israel yeah. were going to vote for the Israeli state. Yeah. And Nelson Rockefeller was instrumental in getting the South American countries and Central American countries, uh, the, mm. uh, the newly founded United Nations, to vote for this right. Israeli state. There were lots of concerns about it. Um, uh, but but Nelson apparently said to David Ben Gurion, uh, yeah. the first Prime Minister of Israel, that um, yeah. that you can either have a country or vengeance, but not <laughs> both. Right. And uh, so the idea was that you had to give up on pursuing the Nazi war criminals if you wanted to get your country. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so this Rockefeller family very very much involved with the. Yeah. Uh, creation of the Israeli state, which I'd like to talk about in a minute, but yeah. I think it's probably better if you don't mind to start chronologically and go right the way back to things yeah. like the the uh, the uh, Kabbalah and right. things like the Zohar uh, and yeah. these influences, because there is this mm -hmm. whole idea of Jewish mysticism, which most Orthodox Jews completely reject, but which yeah. has been kind of carrying on uh, in in the background. In fact, you might even say in the foreground. Yeah, so that's going a lot far, it's pretty far back. So, um, so let's say there's a specific strain of Kabbalah we need to look at. So, Kabbalah, of course, is a it's a it's a set of mystical doctrines. Uh, they can features. This is what I've been really the core aspect of my research has been trying to pinpoint exactly when they emerge, and I pinpoint that to the sixth century uh, BC in Babylon. So, I mean, and so there's really this history, right? So we can summarize it in a few minutes. So uh, basically, um, uh, God asks uh, Abraham to sacrifice uh, his, his child. In the Bible, it's uh, Isaac. And uh, but at the last second, he is saved uh, by an angel and asked to sacrifice a lamb instead. And because of his uh, devotion, God give, makes a promise with him. He promises that, he says, you know, he asks him to look out and, and all the land that he can see will be inherited by his descendants. There will be uh, many, many, many. So uh, Isaac uh, has a son named uh, Jacob, who's later named Israel, who has 12 sons. Um, they end up in Egypt. And they are there for, according to the Bible, approximately 400 years. And then they are rescued by Moses, who brings them back to the Holy Land. Uh, there, eventually, what happens? We have a series. Of, well, the first problem that happens is that when they, when they, were, when they are commanded to conquer, according to the Bible, conquer the land of Palestine, and this is the justification that the Zionists are using to basically slaughter the inhabitants and to remove them, uh, that they were warned that to avoid falling into the worship of the, of the gods of those people. The, the idea was that uh, they were required, they were God's chosen people, and God basically said to them, you know, he chose them above, above all the nations, that they, you know, of all the qualities that they had, that if they all they had to do was follow the Ten Commandments, they would be examples for humanity, and everybody, every, the whole world would regard them as leaders. I'll get to this point later, is how they bastardize that idea. So basically what happens is that they enter palace, they enter uh, Canaan, and within a very short time, they start practicing the cult of the Canaanites, which is the worship of Baal and Astarte, which also includes elements like uh, astrology and magic and things like that. Well, actually, that came later. But anyway, so the story of the Bible from the time of the Exodus to the captivity is the story of various prophets being con constantly sent uh, to try to reform the Jews to return to the to the the, the true religion, to the worship of, of Yahweh God, God, and to the practice of the to the adherence to the Ten Commandments. And but they they don't. It's basically you know as a whole, it's a it's a culture that had completely veered away from Judaism. Uh, even the temple itself, so it would be like the equivalent of the Vatican becoming a, uh, a pagan temple. 
the temple of Solomon itself was turned into a pagan temple. And so the warnings came several times that if they continue those ways, they would be taken into captivity. So what happens in 6597, the Babylonians come. Before that, what happens is that the Syrians come and they conquer the northern kingdom of Israel and send those people off into captivity. They become, you know, from that point forward, the lost tribes. The lower kingdom of Judah is conquered again, I said, in 597. They are taken into captivity in Babylon. And this is where they come in contact with the teachings of the ancient Magi, known to the world as ancient Magi. Uh, but basically what happens is that they come into contact with the teachings of astrology and numerology and magic, which they incorporate with their religion of Baal. But now instead of uh, practicing their cult outwardly, they turn it into, they disguise it as a mystical interpretation of Judaism, which becomes the Kabbalah. And so they, um, the, 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 how basically, so what, how the Kabbalah is effectively, it's a, it's, it's a Gnostic version of Judaism. So it reverses everything. So where uh, God is, uh, God becomes uh, bad and the devil becomes good. Uh, the devil becomes the liberator of humanity. And so they follow the same tire sort of, you know, the, the whole basic teachings and expectations of the end times with the expectations of a prophet to come to uh, install them, to, to gather them back and to uh, lead them from Jerusalem. But they see it uh, in reverse. So the first thing that happens is that uh, Cyrus conquers, I think in 538 BC, and allows the Jews to return to uh, Palestine, where they rebuild the temple. This becomes now the second temple. That temple then is finally uh, destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, and that's the end. And then this is the beginning of the diaspora, when the uh, Jews are required to live in exile all this time. And ever since that time, the majority of Jews have been still hoping for the coming of their Messiah and their return to uh Zion or the Holy Land. The problem is, is that within the Jewish community, you have a certain group, more radical wing, uh, who are followers of the Kabbalah, who have a more uh, distorted view of it. And this is where you get the idea that, so according to the mystical teachings so of the Kabbalah, the Jews are the chosen people. But what that means effectively is that they are... Um, history is laid out for their purpose and that non-jews are uh, expendable and effectively not human so now, 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 i've got to stop you there because this yeah. is sounding a little bit too much to me uh, like yeah. the nazi idea of the master race the aryans and uh, you know putting down the slavs putting down the gypsies uh, putting down the jews etc yes well now we now that's where we're getting to <laughs> so so why, where do we want to start? So basically, you have like the most important develop of, development of Kabbalah is the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria, which is developed in the 1500s. And uh, so this is a key aspect of the, of, the, of the Kabbalah. And so this is why I'm trying to find the book that um, uh, describes this. But it's, um, um, it's an excellent book that's uh, critical of Israel and it traces, it goes, it, it it traces basically the racism of, of a segment of right-wing Zionism to the Kabbalah. And it shows that uh, typically in Halakha, the, when a Jew converts to, uh, to Judaism, he's considered a Jew. But for Kabbalists, they don't. For the Kabbalists, you're a Jew by race. And so this is important because what happens is that the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria inspires the mission of Shabtai Zvi who declares himself Messiah in 1666. This is a mission which is uh, effectively coordinated by a man named Manasseh ben Israel, uh, who is headquartered in Amsterdam, and he's surrounded by these various Rosicrucians called the Hartlib Circle, which is Samuel Hartlib, John Dury, and Comenius. And they help him uh, communicate with Oliver Cromwell to uh, get Cromwell to allow the Jews to return to uh, England because they were banned from uh, entry since uh, 1290 by Edward the First. So in 
So that happens, and what happens then is that the, the first synagogue is established in London, uh, which is called Bevis Marks. And it's basically the run by Sabbatians or followers of Shabbatai Zavi. Uh, about a hundred years later, in the mid-1700s, you get the, the successor of Shabbatai Zavi. His name is Jacob Frank. He openly uh, claims to be a reincarnation of Shabbatai Zavi. And he teaches, so now I can tell you, refer to you with somebody like Gershom Shalom, who is really the world-renowned expert on this subject. And he shows that the Frankists followed a religion of what he called religious nihilism. And effectively, they believe that, um, you know, the Messiah wouldn't return until the world had become completely rotten. So they had to assist in uh, in sowing as much chaos as possible uh, because they rejected the Bible uh, in favor of the Zohar. Uh, in fact, if you go back to the, the teaching of Sabbatai Zvi, he taught that with the arrival of the Messiah, the laws of the Bible are no longer applicable, which is why the Sabbatians were known for practicing uh, orgies that involved uh, incest and adultery. So um, these same practices then, of course, were repeated by uh, Jacob Frank. One of his important successors, because Jacob Frank's cousin was no Moses Dabrushka, he founded an organization called the Asiatic Brethren. And so their members were closely affiliated with Moses Mendelssohn. And I know I've talked about this before, but there's Rabbi Antelman who's really written a great book about the survival of Sabbatianism and Judaism and its subversion of Judaism uh, called, two volumes called To Eliminate the Opiate. And he found uh, in a library in New York, a list of ordination uh, that showed a list of the successors, the ordained successor of Shabbat Zvi and Moses Mendelssohn was... Uh, was uh, the, the the last um, at that time because it's a list that was preserved by his friend uh, Nikolai, who was the publisher for the Illuminati. Uh, Mendelssohn wasn't a member of the Illuminati himself, but all he had several friends who were like uh, Gottfried Lessing and, and a whole network. And um, so Moses Mendelssohn was a promoter of what's called Haskalah, which was to to promote the Jews to get out, so-called, quote-unquote, out of the ghetto. So until that point, Jews have been living uh, largely secluded in their communities where they followed uh, Jewish traditions. But um, people like Mendelssohn, uh, he was also a follower of Spinoza, who was the uh, student of Manasseh ben Israel, who had been excommunicated. And this is important because a lot of people forget that Judaism is a religion. And at one point before the Zionists came along, it was possible to be excommunicated from it. You're Jewish if you follow Judaism, regardless of, you know, if you convert or not. And you are no longer Jewish if you stop practicing. And so Spinoza was excommunicated for his heresy because he's, Spinoza is celebrated, of course, these days, especially, you know, if, you, if you've suffered from Western indoctrination in their universities. He's sort of celebrated as, you know, the first secular Jew, one of the first uh, to sort of incept, you know, begin Bible criticism. But he effectively uh, explained that, you know, uh, I can't remember the details, but basically something to the effect that, you know, the rules of Judaism are just applicable to, it's more of a national standard and it's not really necessary to follow it. So this is kind of what Pendleton was, was proposing. And this is why he promoted the assimilation of Jews into uh, German society. So basically, they would throw off their, you know, captains and their curls and their hats, and they would basically put on suits and become lawyers and doctors and become indistinguishable from the rest of the community. And that was his response to the Jewish question. So this is where it gets interesting. His daughter was Dorothea Mendelssohn, and she was married to Friedrich Schlegel, who is the man, the European uh, scholar historian, who coined the term Aryan race. So when you look at the term Aryan, the whole idea of the Aryan race is a Kabbalistic idea. Uh, it's, it's, it's not expressed that way openly, but there's enough hints in the language when you look at how what the, the Aryan race was referred to, but they're typically identified as descendants of Cain, who had survived the flood of Atlantis. Uh, they were uh, descendants of the sons of God of the Bible, uh, who were, you know, were supposedly these giants who lived uh, before the flood. 
they survived Atlantis and then they uh, uh, landed in the mountains of Asia or specifically the Caucasus and then spread out through India and to Europe, which is why they're referred to as the Indo-Europeans. So it's important to remember at this point now that the Kabbal that the inner theory of inner race was a Kabbalistic idea. And this is how it was picked up later uh, by the occult revival. So the Asiatic Brethren, which was founded again by um, Jacob Frank's cousin, Moses Dobrushka, became the core um, influence behind what's called the occult revival. They were also affiliated with what's called the Frankfurt Newton Lodge, which was set up by uh, members of the Asiatic Brethren. <clears throat> what's interesting is that the Grand Master of the Asiatic Brethren was Prince Charles of Hessen Kessel. And he was from a family that had, um, he was a descendant of what's called the alchemical wedding. So when the Rosicrucian movement uh, emerged, the, the, it was centered around the marriage of Frederick V of the Palatinate and Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of King James. And it was celebrated in a, in a uh, Rosicrucian book called the, Al, the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosicruc, which means an alchemical wedding. And so, um, you know, when when they what they tried to do is that they they tried to uh, offer the crown to, to the crown of Bohemia to Frederick, that triggered the Habsburgs to uh, put a stop to it and ignited the Thirty Years' War. So the Rosicrucian movement was effectively uh, dispersed. This is how they ended up in London working with Manasseh uh, ben uh, Israel. But what happened is that even though they lost their grandchildren. Their grandson was uh, George I, and then ever since then, um, the, the 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 royal family of England has been uh, governed, ruled by the monarchs who are descended from this alchemical wedding. So there's several people, important people, who are descended from uh, that alchemical wedding. The other one is Frederick II, the Frederick the Great of Prussia, who was Grand Master of Scottish Rite for Masonry, but also this Prince Charles of Hessen Kessel, who was the Grand Master of the Asiatic Brethren. So, uh, according to the name of this researcher, is a Dutch researcher. He looked at the family archive and he discovered that Prince Charles of Hessen Kessel was the one who introduced the swastika as the symbol of the Asiatic Brethren alongside the Star of David, which had been introduced by Moses Dobrushka. Both symbols became, you know, core symbols of the Asiatic uh, Brethren. The Star of David, of course, is not a Jewish symbol. It's a magical symbol from the uh, Kabbalistic, the practical Kabbalah of the Middle Ages, <clears throat> which then became identified falsely as the seal of Solomon. And the swastika, the reason it was adopted is because it was an Indian symbol that was believed to be uh, a hallmark of the survival of the Aryans. And uh, in this case, they thought it was a representative of reincarnation which is found in Buddhism, was, was uh, similar to a belief called Gilgul from the Kabbalah, which also has a kind of belief in reincarnation. Mm, it, I mean, it does seem as if um, uh, official Judaism, if there's such a thing, has kind of completely yeah. lost control. Uh, and these heresies are just uh, taking off the center. Yes. Um, but I mean, you, you're talking about the Star of David there, um, right. these two triangles, one superimposed upon another. This has become obviously a, ma a massive symbol now yeah. uh, for the on the Israeli flag, etc. Um, yeah. But it's not the, quite the same as the Seal of Solomon, is it? Which I think is something like a... Is it a nine or twelve pointed um, um, object? Which it's yeah. it's similar, but it's a, there's a lot more sides to it. And see, the seal of Solomon was supposed to have been associated with John D, who was yeah. the uh, advisor to Elizabeth I and one of the originators of the British Empire uh, back in the 1500s. Right. Well, I mean, there is no seal of Solomon, but the the idea is it comes from the legend that when seal of, that Solomon had the, was granted the power to employ uh, demons, spirits, uh, in Islam they're called jinn, to assist him in building the temple. And so he had, he, he had a ring which had a seal on it, which is what would apparently gave him power over these entities. And so this is why, this is why, this is why the, you know, this craft, witchcraft, is sort of supposed to be the craft of Freemasonry. And this is why Masons uh, allegorically are trying to rebuild the Temple of Solomon by using the craft and the seal of Solomon, uh, which is control over entities, to rebuild the 
the temple, which is an allegory for building uh, effectively, you know, sorry for the cliche, but a new world order. Yeah, well, this te- this temple, uh, it's quite interesting the way that um, the Masons r- revere Solomon, but not David. I mean, David was an exemplary king, uh, whereas Solomon was a very much a fallen king. But anyway, look, let's get back to Zionism and its origins, yeah. because yeah. Uh, a lot of what you're saying is almost leading up to yeah. people like Lord Palmerston, who mm-hmm. wasn't a, a Jew. He was one of the first yeah. people in his papers after mm-hmm. his death it was discovered that he'd been saying hey, uh, the Jews desire uh, to to move to Palestine. Well, yep. the Jews had not actually been even asked by Palmerston, but he decided that that's yep. where they wanted to go. And then, of course, yep. we've got uh, Theodore Herzl and the much more yep. formalised uh, international Zionist congresses in the in the yep. mid no, well, the late 1800s. Yes, but it does start because what's happened, what was happening around Palmerston is there was a lot of move, a lot of moves in the secret societies. Uh, towards that end, particularly the Carbonari, who were headed by Giuseppe Mazzini, who by some accounts was the successor of of, uh, of Adam Weishaupt. But he was he was working with a guy who was the ultimate intriguer. His name is Filippo Bonarotti, who was who was a member of the Illuminati. And uh, so this is when they started to work towards uh, effectively what were like proto-Zionist goals, uh, but at the time by care, you know, fomenting various revolutions, particularly the revolutions of the year, what's called the year revolutions of 1848, and through the communist movement. So admirers and admirer of Buonarroti was, uh, was Karl Marx, who of course was a Rothschild uh, agent. The Rothschilds are key here. They, you know, they're really kind of the family behind all of this stuff. They have immense connections all over the place to the Illuminati. They have connections to the, especially to the to the uh, Asiatic Brethren. They were backers of the Juden Lodge. Um, they and the more important organization here is called the um, Alliance, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, the Universal. Is Israelite Alliance, and this was founded by Adolf Kramer, who was the Grand Master of French Freemasonry, particularly of the Right of Memphis, sorry, Might of Mizraim. And um, so this is where it gets really interesting. So his protege was a guy named Maurice Jolie, and Maurice Jolie wrote the book, I can't remember, Dialogues Between Montesquieu and Machiavelli, or something like that. And uh, it's according to Alan Bellis, in I think it's early in the 1920s, long before he became head of the CIA, he communicated to the London Times that hey, he said he thinks he found the source of the protocols, and he claimed that it you know it was forged, it was a forgery, a plagiar, a plagiarized from uh, Jolie's book. But what they don't tell you is that Jolie was a member of the lodge of the Memphis of the Miserium Lodge with Cremier. And uh, what's interesting is that so Sergei Nihilus is the is the guy who first uh, received a copy of the protocols before he translated it to Russian in 1901, I think. And he received it from a woman named Yuliana Glinka. And she had received it in turn from somebody who pulled it from Jolie's uh, Miserum Lodge. But uh, Yuliana Glinka was a protege of H.B. Blavatsky. And so now, you know, now we're getting back to, so the, the whole, not, what basically waspness that could produce the protocols is really fascinating. So it's a circle that incorporates not only Blavatsky, but also Pepys, who was, you know, one of the leading occultists of his time. And another guy who's very fascinating was W.T. Stead, William T. Stead, who was a famous uh, British journalist at the time. And uh, so, first of all, you get back to Blavatsky. So, Blavatsky was the first important uh, development in the, at least in the occult of the theory of the, of the development of her versions of the theories of the Aryan race. And so, where the earlier scholars were, um, you know, um, 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 avoided overt associations with Atlantis, she basically laid it all out. 
and it's her ideas that influence Nazis, particularly through uh, two characters, uh, Lance von Liebenfels and Guido von List. And um, um, what their doctrines are called, Ariostophy. So, in fact, maybe we can back a little bit. Where I think the, the 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 character who seems to have really been responsible for this strategy, which is basically of, is uh, Richard Wagner. So Wagner, it's interesting. His his, his he married Cosima, the daughter of Franz Liszt, and uh, and I can't remember her name, uh, Madame Dagou or something like that who was involved closely with the entire, she was friends with Mazzini. She was involved in the entire network of the Carbonari. And uh, uh, even Marx used to visit her salons as well. And uh, Wagner and Cosima also had their own networks of friendships with former members of the Carbonari. In fact, Wagner was involved in the revolutions of 1848 and uh, collaborated with Bakunin, who was an, an avowed uh, Satanist. So this is despite the fact, so of course, Wagner becomes buddies with Nietzsche, uh, very much inspires him, becomes his idol. Uh, Nietzsche, though, even suspects that uh, Wagner is Jewish. This is despite the fact, of course, that Wagner was uh, an open anti-Semite. So this is where we get to understand that, you know, what we're talking about here is a Frankist tradition uh, you know, I, you can, there's an excellent article written by an academic called, uh, uh, I think, Abraham Ducker about the Frankist movement. And what he shows is, you know, that the Frankists are effectively an anti-Semitic sect. Because, well, I mean, you know, I think there's probably quite a lot of Jews uh, right uh, in Israel right now wondering, you know, if the government is anti-Semitic because it seems yes. to be putting the entire future of their dream at, mm -hmm. at risk. But look, can we, can I drag you back to uh, yeah. Herzl and, and uh, this creation? Because I mean, I'm, exactly I, I, where never, we're going. I, I think it's fascinating because yeah. I was looking at the, um, um, you know, the, the British clearing uh, the Ottomans out of um, uh, in the First World War in 1917 and yeah. 1918, only to find that the uh, the two big campaigns, the first one with, by Allenby in Gaza, yeah. finished with the the literally the, that week the Balfour yeah. Declaration being yes. published in London, and the same with the um, the campaign of Megiddo in the south in in Palestine, yes. uh, clearing yes. the Ottomans right out, routing them and kicking them out of Palestine effectively, uh, and and once that had happened, the end of that week we had a. Uh, surrender signed by the Ottomans and the World War One came to an end. So it's almost as yeah. if that first World War was a culmination of something which Herzl and the rest of them have been planning for a long time. Yes, yes. a long time. Yes. And it comes, it, start, it starts with Wagner. So Wagner, basically his ideas, or oh, he became really sort of the, the idol of the entire what's called pan-German and folkish movement. And folk, the, the folk is an idea which was developed by Gottfried Herder, who again was an admirer of Moses Mendelssohn. And there's basically a development of the idea of the Aryan race, where they, it's, again, it goes back to the idea that uh, uh, the, 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 the quality of a people is not determined in their, in their uh, culture, but in their race, right? So what makes but its racial identity is what defines the people, their their traditions, their, you know, their location, their their upbringing, not their upbringing, sorry, you know, mostly external factors, right? No, no free will. So this folk idea basically inspired this folkish movement. We started to celebrate the virtues of the Aryan race in particular and uh, developed into this what's called this pan-German uh, movement. One of the most, the most important uh, ideologue of the movement was a guy named uh, George von Schoenerer, who again was an admirer of Wagner. And so uh, the the the, the pan-German folkish movement, particularly because uh, he was an Austrian, so it was it it was largely uh, flourishing in Austria, which is where Hitler came from, and um, 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 was spreading through a various number of uh, basically university fraternities 
One of them in particular was called the Albia, uh, Albia fraternity. And that's where Herzl got his start. So Herzl, before he started to, you know, founded the Zionist, uh, World Zionist Organization or convened the Zionist Congress in 1797, 1897, was a member of this right-wing, uh, folkish, pan-German, uh, racist, uh, proto-Nazi uh, organization, which was connected to this uh, von Schoenner and expressing the very same ideas. Because even when you could look at a guy like von Schoenner, he was uh, he was Jewish or secretly Jewish, just like Wagner was. Uh, even Nietzsche, his best friend who, who inspired him was Paul Ray, who was Jewish. It's consistent that what you find, and this is what I wanted to explain, is that the Frankists are anti-Semitic. So, you know, like... Like if I talked with, you know, my, let's say, you know, if I talk about Muslims, we would be critical of Muslims, but that doesn't make us uh, anti semitic anti-Muslim. And so the Frankists are critical of non-Frankist Muslims. And in fact, what Abraham Ducker suggests is that they are even sort of vengeful because of the persecutions that they were forced to endure uh, as heretics. And so they've got this long-standing bitterness towards non-Jews and eventually, which is, you know, extended from um um, I'm Zionist to non-Zionist. So, you know, especially what happened in Germany is that you have all these Jews that had assimilated. And so now they consider themselves superior to this flood of Eastern European Jews that started to come into uh, Germany called the Ostjuden. And so this is why you look at the literature of the early Zionists and even Herzl himself. In fact, Herzl wrote this entire uh He's, you know, it's called self-hatred, right, uh, in the Jewish culture. He wrote this book, which is considered a classic of hatred, uh, self-hatred, called Mauschel, which is a derogatory term for, for a Jews, to refer to this, you know, these sort of uh, uncouth uh, Eastern Jews that were flooding into Germany, and they're basically an embarrassment to the efforts of, uh, of the German Jews to try to rehabilitate their, their image. And uh, so this is kind of where this dichotomy comes from. And this is where this like, this is how it was affected that you've had these uh, Zionists who were with, working within the racist movements who were expressing anti-Semitic uh, or, or promoting anti-Semitic sentiments directed towards effectively Jews who were traditional Jews, normal Jews, you know, people who practice Judaism because this is exactly what they were opposed to. Is something that they were trying to subvert. So that's effectively it. So this is why, you know, what's interesting I want to come back to is that um, the the um, when the Balfour Declaration was uh, written, it was written to um, address to Lord Walter Rothschild, right? But he was asked to transmit it to the uh, Zionist Federation of Great Britain. And the leader of the Zionist generation of the Federation was uh, Joseph Cowan. And Joseph Cowan uh, was a friend with the same network of ex Carbonari that were connected to Wagner. And, uh, and so when he, when uh, Herzl wanted to uh, communicate with Cecil Rhodes, because he thought Cecil Rhodes would give him the backing that he needed to communicate with um, he wanted to bribe uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. He reached out to, um, to um, um, uh, I think it was, yes, he reached out to Joseph Cowan to uh, to intercede uh, through Double T Stead. And this is how now we come back to the protocols of Zion. So effectively, you know, there's a fascinating, uh, there's a, there's a, the documentary by an Israeli uh, documentary filmmaker about the ADL called Defamation. And um, at one point, um, he so he interviews Abe Foxman, and Abe Foxman makes a really, really surprising admission because the, the, the filmmaker interview, interviews asks him, he says, he looks at Abe Foxman, who's just, you know, basically some schmuck from New York, who gets invited to uh, visit all these world leaders. And so a Foxman asked him like, how, why, how was that possible? Like, why are they rolling out the red carpet for you? He said, well, he said, let me put it like this. He said, the Jews are not as powerful as the Jews think they are, but not as, uh, not as powerful as the uh, non-Jews think they are. 
said it's somewhere in between in his New York accent. And then he explains, he says, how do you fight the conspiratorial view of the Jews without exploiting it? And this is his own words, right? So anti-Semitism is necessary. It's part, it's, it is the strategy, and it's the strategy that goes back to Wagner, is the need that the plan is to fulfill Bible prophecy of the return of the Jews to Palestine according to a perverted Kabbalistic interpretation of the Bible. And the ends justify the means. And so nothing, nothing is off the, on, off the table. Any methods can be used. In fact, the more devious, the more outlandish, the more daring, the better. Because then you're proving, you know, your, your willingness to uh, commit to this uh, uh, mission. And so that meant effectively infiltrating, first of all, um, not just promoting, but basically cultivating um, cultivating a racist right, because what they did, it wouldn't have existed otherwise. So basically Zionists created the racist movement in Austria, which that eventually came, Hitler came from, and then as a tool to, to, uh, to gain favor for the Zionist cause and ultimately uh, you know, uh, instill enough fear into the European Jews to force them to migrate uh, to Israel. And that's how you can understand uh, the Hitler movement. Well, uh, yeah, let, let's um, bring it up to date a bit more, though, because we've seen uh, over the last month and a bit more uh, the most horrific um, bombing a- a- attack on uh, Gaza. I mean, this is an area which has been slowly isolated, turned into a prison camp, basically. And um, and why is it, though, do you think that there is this uh, such a, a strong enthusiasm for the for the Israelis from Britain and the United States we've got we've been having these massive marches in London uh, and yet the government including the opposition uh, are refusing they're saying oh well we can have a few uh, humanitarian pauses but no ceasefire actually what's going on is we've got uh, what uh, you know in, in rather incredible war crimes going on in front of our eyes uh, yeah. With with almost no uh, pushback from the West at all, and you can imagine, can't you, if either the British Prime Minister or the U.S. President were to say stop Israel, they would probably stop straight away. Uh, yeah. Well, it's not going to happen because effectively we have got working in the background Freemason Reed and another order, uh, which is the Bene Brith, which is basically sort of a quasi uh, Masonic. Uh, uh, his Zionist version of uh, Freemasonry. What's interesting is a friend of mine just happened to send me today by a, a French uh, lecturer who's talking about um, uh, agents of the Mossad, basically a branch of Mossad agents that are called Sayanim. And these are basically unpaid agents, effectively, not you know, not on the payroll, but who sort of volunteer to contribute to the Zionist cause. So you're looking to basically at you know, this is how you explain uh, people like Palmerston. Miss Palmerston was working with Mazzini, right? In fact, you call him, in fact, Palmerston is effectively considered to have guided Mazzini. Um, uh, you have people like Lord Shaftesbury, who was the first one to make an open call for the return of uh, Jews to Zion, to the land of Zion, Holy Land, working as well with Palmerston. Um, um, you know, so yes, you're basically looking at, and you know, this is why this is how the whole idea of, uh, of this maintaining this idea of, of Jewish power is necessary, and this is why the protocols are necessary because they they use the perception of their power to their advantage, and and this is this is I I can I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but this is basically advice uh, given by Heim Weitzman, something to the effect that you know. Um, you know, we were even though we're not as powerful as they think they are, we need to we need to continue to le- let them think that. So, you know, what you can imagine is that many times you're looking at people like uh, Lord Balfour, uh, another member of the Round Table. Uh, these are, you know, the the thing is that the Zionists have the um, Rothschilds as their chief backers. So, uh, you know, we don't hear about it, but likely. Uh, what happens is that uh, you know countries are threatened 
like Britain in particular, would have been threatened that either they're offered favors or they're offered threats that that the uh, Rothschilds would be able to affect with the power at their control. You know, like there's a famous line I haven't been able to substantiate it, but something to the effect where Rothschild said, you know, I don't care what puppet rules as long as I've got control of the money, the money supply. And so they can ease, they, they, they pull they pull the levers so they're able to uh, easily make threats or, or promises that are powerful enough to induce, uh, you know, whatever country to do their bidding. Well, that's right. I mean, someone like Gordon Brown, you know, in 2008 being told, you know, either you're going to uh, give the banking system a massive bailout or else the whole lot's going to come crashing down. Well, he, you know, exactly. he does exactly what he's told. Tough choice. Uh, yeah. Well, look, finally, David, fascinating insight into how we got here. Um, from from what you know and from your reading of their plans, effectively, yeah. uh, where we, whereabouts is this all heading? What's the object of it all? Let me read exactly what uh, Ben Gurion said in uh, Fascinating. He says it all. He said that it's in a speech in uh, in 1962. Okay, so he basically said uh, he shared his vision for the future. He said the image of the world in 1987 has traced in my imagination. Call it. The Cold War will be a thing of the past. Internal pressure of the constantly growing intelligentsia in Russia for more freedom and the pressure of the masses for raising their standard of living uh, may lead to a gradual democratization of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the increasing influence of the workers and farmers and the rising political importance of men of science may transform the United States into a welfare state with a planned economy. Western and Eastern Europe will become a federation of autonomous states having a socialist and democratic regime, with the exception of the USSR as a federated Eurasian state. All other continents will become united in a world alliance, at whose disposal will be an international police force. All armies will be abolished, and there will be no more wars. In Jerusalem, the United Nations, uh, in brackets, a truly United Nations, will build a shrine of the prophets to serve the federated union of all continents. This will be the seat of the Supreme Court of Mankind to settle all controversies among the federated continents as prophesied by Isaiah. I mean, it looks like we're heading for a much more chaotic version than Ben-Gurion was prophesying there. Well, it's, yeah, well, sure. So, you know, the, the, the some of the political background is a little off, but the point there is that it's a United Nations with a seat in Israel as fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Okay? So this is what they've been working on for 2,000 years. Right? You know, in, the, in at least this one group who have their particular Kabbalistic interpretation, they're trying to fulfill Bible prophecy, which they believe claims that they will be. In fact, you know, I, asked, I took a, a course in Hebrew Bible at university. By a, it was taught by a Jewish rabbi. And he could basically try to, you know, it took me a while to realize that he was trying to teach us that the covenant was the underlying theme of the Old Testament. And finally I asked him, okay, well, then what's the point? He said, well, he said, in, in the end, he said, the Messiah will return and the Jews will rule the world in peace. No, it's, it's a fundamental uh, Zionist belief. So this is what they're, I don't know why, I, I assume this is obvious to most people, but that's what they're, that's what they're working for. They're trying. They're trying to. They want to rebuild the third temple, right? They 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 they're working to the, the whole point of Zionism is to return the Jews to Israel as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy to yeah, to, well, es to establish Jerusalem as the seat of a world government. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the trouble is they're not really carrying uh, the rest of the world with them. They seem to be hell bent on doing this, no matter how many people they kill along oh, the wayside yeah. anyway david could you do you think um just let people know where where they can get hold of your books yeah so i've got a website which is ordoabcao.ca. um that's yeah that's my main website which i keep most of my material i find links to my books there my latest book is entirely uh, available online as web pages okay david and i'll just finish well look i mean i said i've finished about three times now but um <laughs> just to get read this quote from sax roma who 
many people will know was in the Golden Dawn with good old Alistair Crowley. Uh, he lived in Rygate, actually. Um, his, his house is still there. I remember uh, chatting to somebody who was just walking into the house saying, did you know this is Sax Roma's house? Oh, yes. A couple of years ago. Anyway, he's he, this is a quote of his. He says, my power This is talking about Fu Manchu. He's the, the novelist. My power rests in the east, but my hand is stretched out to the west. I shall restore the lost grandeur of China when your civilization, as you're pleased to term it, has exterminated itself. When you've reduced to ashes your palaces and your temples, when in your blindness you have set back the clock, which so laboriously you fashioned, I shall stir out of the fire. I shall rise. The red dusk of the west will have fallen. The golden dawn of the east will come. Anyway, so that's his uh, take on it. Okay. Anyway, thanks ever so much right. for joining us. Okay. Thanks, Cheers, David. Bye. Okay, bye.